Hello, lovelies. Have you all been playing with your super sensible members of your body? <laughs> Have you been playing with your angel or your elemental? I really hope so. I'm still playing with mine and having a fabulously interesting time. But I had a memory about when I was a little girl that I wanted to share with you as a mm, kind of an analogy for what we're going to be talking about today. My father was a publisher back in the day. And um, interestingly enough, he published two categories of books. One was occult books. <laughs> it's no wonder I turned out the way that I am, eh? And the other one was fishing books. He was big into fishing or really all kinds of oceanography, right? So fishing and sailing and scuba diving and all of that kind of business. And so his business was kind of divided between the occult and the mm, oceanography stuff. But there was this one book that to me was the perfect combination of both of those books. And it was called Dangerous Marine Animals. Now this book, holy moly, it was like, I don't know, about as thick as a mm, Bible. And, um, on every page, it had a creature and there was a picture and there was the description of the creature, how it got you, and then a big picture of what it looked like when it got you. And this book included everything from shells to sea creatures to sharks, octopuses, jellyfish, all kinds of things. And it was the most horrifying book <laughs> Because some of the things that happen to you, if you tangled with the wrong shell even, let alone the wrong octopus or the wrong shark, were the most horrifying things that I'd ever seen. Like things would blow up and swell up and go red and, oh my God, as a little kid, it was my, it was my horror story book. Uh, basically, I would describe it to people as you touch this, you die, touch this and you die, touch this and you die, touch that and you die. And I remember that he took us to this island once. It was Heron, Heron Island. And Heron Island had a bunch of these shells, these very poisonous shells. And so when we went, I was already acquainted with some of them because of this book. But when we went to the location, they sat us down for 40 minutes with a slideshow that was basically touch this and die as well. I'm like, what the hell are we even here for? <laughs> Why are you bringing me to this touch this and die place? Well, the reason was, is that we had the most fabulous time, right? We went diving, we got our scuba diving licenses, and we had just the most amazing time to get acquainted with the most amazing realm that we had not ever explored before. And so it's a great analogy for what I'm going to be talking about today. There is another realm that we aren't acquainted with, and there are creatures that you touch and you die. Well, maybe, I don't know about that, but they can cause a lot of trouble for you. As well as creatures that are absolutely beautiful and amazing. And so... I think just like the 45-minute slide at Heron Island, if we're going to start exploring this super sensible realm, then it only behooves us to learn about the creatures. And to do that, we're going to draw again on Thomas Mayer's fabulous work. So I hope you enjoy it. We're going to primarily concentrate on what Thomas Mayer calls the adversary spirits for this podcast anyway, and we're going to introduce you to the terrain as well as the creatures that exist within this terrain. So think of this as dangerous spiritual animals or entities, if you will, So, uh, <laughs> and where they live, okay? So we're going to uh, start off with the dark inner layers of the earth. These are spiritual spheres of the earth in which the collective, unredeemed, old karma of humanity gathers. Traditionally, a distinction is made between nine layers. The nine beautitudes also refer to these inner layers of the earth. Dante Alighieri, I didn't even know his last name, right? This is Dante, who describes the nine levels in his divine comedy. 
We humans are related to these inner layers of the earth with our doppelganger double. Actually, these should be permeated with light in the long term, but initially they often darken in the life of the soul. The dark inner layers of the earth are inhabited by adversary spirits. So then there is the light inner layer of the earth. These are spiritual spheres of the earth in which the light spirits and beings live. Through them flows the love of Mother Earth. The light inner layers of the earth are not connected to the dark inner layers of the earth. Now, there's the adversary spirits that we've um, already spoken about, Lucifer and Araman. But there's one other group that Chance has actually spoken about in Season 3 of Magical Egypt, and these are the Asuras. In addition to the angelic hierarchy oriented towards divine love, there are also fallen angels. Without their resistance, the world would not develop. And this is a really key point. <laughs> I don't know if I have this kind of mythology or the story correct, but basically what was happening is that humans weren't developing fast enough. Under the matriarchal religions, we were kind of contented cows. We were just happy and boring. And uh, the Powers that be from the angelic perspective were like, what do we need to do to get these humans to develop a little bit? And it was decided that they needed both support and challenge to grow, as Martini points out, as I have pointed out before. And so the big brains decided, all right, we need to give the humans some challenge, some resistance in order for them to develop and it was agreed that this evil, this challenge, would eventually lose. But they were allowed to put up one hell of a fight. And it appears that that's exactly what they are doing. So these fallen angels also constitute us as human beings. These include the Luciferic, Aramanic, and Asuric dark angelic beings which are described in detail in Anthropophysy. Now, just on that point, there is a gentleman on YouTube that basically has recorded all of Rudolf Steiner's lectures. And this is kind of where I started with Steiner, is just putting them on and listening to them. And it's amazing what you learn. So if you want to learn more, that's a really great place to start. And then all of his lectures are also um, posted in reading format on a website. And then, of course, you can get his books. But um, just as a side note there, the Aramanic beings are the spirits of materialism, of coldness and darkness. We've talked about Araman, right? We've spent a few lectures talking about Araman and the aspects of him that relate to materialism in several of our podcasts. The Luciferic beings are the spirits of pride, arrogance, egomania, and blinding light. And remember, I said that if Lucifer and Araman had a baby, it would be Yuval. <sighs> so, see why? The Asuric beings are the spirits of fragmentation and the dissolution of the eye. In Sanskrit, the term Asuras refers to evil spirits or opponents of the gods. That is a generic term, while Rudolf Steiner uses it to describe a special kind of fallen angelic being. Now, Chance talks about these Asuras in The Churning of the Milky Ocean, and I think he's done it on a couple of podcasts as well, but it's one of his favorite mythological allegories, and the Asuras play a big part of that. All these adversary spirits belong to our spiritual planetary system and have, if they are redeemed and transformed within divine love and the power of the eye, very positive effects. If they're redeemed. I would like to emphasize that this is not a theoretical construct or belief system, but that in supersensible perception, one constantly encounters these beings. Learning to deal with these dark beings is also a condition of a healthy spiritual path of training. 
Okay, so just like dangerous marine animals, if we want to play in the ocean, we need to understand the terrain and the creatures. So if we're going to play in the spiritual realm, we need to understand the terrain and the creatures. The next category is seratic spirit beings. These are a fourth group of adversary spirits, which originate from spirit realms outside of our planetary system, from primeval cosmic times and expanses. They actually have no business in the spiritual space of Earth, but they are pushing their way in nevertheless. They can seduce people because they promise great power. People addicted to power easily fall prey to seratic beings who are the inspirers of evil. These are described in the Bible in the Revelation of John, the Apocalypse, as the two-horned beast. In Gnosticism, they are referred to the term archons. We've spoken about archons before, haven't we, my lovelies? Now, archons, again, I think I've spoken about John Lamb and his Sophia story, mythology. And John Lamb really goes into a fantastic definition. John Lamb Lash, his name is John Lamb Lash. So if you want to really kind of get into the whole Archon stories, go Google him and you'll get the full download on Sophia and the Archons and their motivation, their intellect, the whole thing. It's really fabulous. Okay, well, the next category of spirits are the seratic spirits of transhumanism. These are a special group of seratic beings And they're referred to here as the spirits of transhumanism because they seem to inspire transhumanism. These are central to understanding and since these beings are connected with the very highest adversary powers, it can be assumed that all processes emanating from them are very harmful to human beings. This will become more understandable during the course of this book. Then there is a being called the being. Now, every has a being in the spiritual world, a kind of living archetypal idea. One could call it also a group soul and group spirit. Or Mark Stavish, who I've interviewed before, has a book on egregore, And it could also very well be termed an egregore. And it's not an abstract idea, but a multifaceted spiritual space filled with consciousness, an essential inner structure. With the and this enters the human aura and is active there. Then there is a large being in the lower layers of the spiritual world. And at the same time, there are reduced or smaller replicas, One could call them descendants, perhaps, working in the human aura. The is being networked with other spirit beings, which give it a special character. For example, it is connected to certain Aramanic angelic beings who work through the being in the person. When connected to seratic spirits, seratic spirits gain access to the supersensible members of the human being. Then there is a disease being. So every disease also has a being or an egregore in the spiritual world, which connects with the human being as required. Now, one of the most interesting things to me when I interviewed Thomas Mayer about these entities and these beings was The idea that these, let's say specifically these beings, were created deliberately on purpose by the, whatever, pharmacologists (laughs) that developed these. And Thomas may have made a very interesting point. And the point is, is that, no, that is not necessarily the case. The point is, is that whenever humanity creates something new on the material plane, 
something on the spiritual plane is also created. And he explained that a lot has to do with the intent of the creation. And the intent of the creation goes a long way to determining the nature of the being that is going to be created on the spiritual realm. Let me have Thomas explain this in his own words. That's, that's always a problem if we create new things, that we should always look on the spiritual levels. But it's, it's not only the question, with, it's a general question. With every new technology, uh, we do not only create something on the physical realm, we also create spiritual beings and we attract spiritual beings. And it's a big problem if we are not aware of. Then it, it's like black magic ritual. It could be if we attract bad beings. When we're reading that, I wasn't sure if it was done deliberately on purpose. But you're saying that when we are just by virtue of being creators ourselves, that when we invent things, we are either inviting or creating these elementals just as a natural course of being creator beings ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so is it. And to make it a little bit easier to understand, you only can perceive your own thinking. And if you perceive your own thinking in meditation, then you could experience that around every thought you are creating, there is an atmosphere. And it could be a warm atmosphere, an open atmosphere. That means that you are inviting angels or the love of Christ into your thinking. But you also can think in a in an aggressive way, closed thoughts, or hurting thoughts. And that means you are inviting demons. I think that experience everyone can have, but that is quite flexible with our thinking. But if we are creating a new technology, it's uh, more constant. And though we have technologies who are always bringing bad spirits into our earthly life, that, that's, that's the main thought. Though so that means we uh, really have to be careful what we are creating and we should always look if the right spirits around a new creation. But that's not normal. No university will you learn something about it. We are totally blind, totally in, in a deep sleep in this point. And I think that's the main reason really bad entities outside of our earth evolutions are attracted. In anthroposophy, we called it uh, soratic beings. In other traditions, there are other names of it. But the main idea is they are not a part of our earth evolution. They are coming from other spiritual fields out of our earth evolution. But we are attracting them, and they really had a quite bad influence. So that's that's a that's a quite main point. I uh, I know that it's not easy to understand. That was the reason why I wrote a long book <laughs> with a lot of stories and explanations. So it's possible really to deep in. Well, that's certainly a lot to think about, isn't it? Lovely is that our thoughts and our creations have an impact on the spiritual realms that we, through our intentions, our moods, our feelings, can either attract or create entities <laughs> that we have to deal with and possibly the rest of society has to deal with as well. And we can't see them. I don't know about you, but I've just had the last three days from hell. I think I have PTSD. And uh, Thomas Sheridan has this thing called the Psychic Weather Report. And he describes, I think what he's describing is times when these entities are rising up in number and power and 
they have an impact on our moods and our interactions with people. At least that's what I think he's talking about. At least it makes a lot more sense as a result of what Thomas is saying. Anyway, more soon, lovelies. We'll start getting into the nitty gritty next week. Thank you all for listening and more soon. Thank you for listening, lovelies. And we have the Women of Wisdom, a celebration of the immaterial coming up at the end of January. If you would like to learn more about that, please go to MagicalEgypt.com. You will find the link. And if you want to come, use the coupon code EGYPT to get 50% off your VIP pass. We will have discussions and workshops and roundtables and interviews. It is going to be absolutely fabulous. So I hope to see you there. Immaterial. Yeah.